Mark chapter 5, we are looking at the parable of the sower, Jesus' primary uh, parable on discipleship and responding to the gospel and what to look for uh, and what to be on guard against so that we uh, can have a fruitful life and not let anything get in the way of that. And last week we looked at the parable's second soil, the, the one that spoke of the seed being sown among rocky places. I'll just review that. In Matthew chapter 13, verses 20 and 21, Jesus said, The one on whom the seed was sown on rocky places, this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with what? Joy. Receives it with joy immediately, yet has no firm what? Root. No firm root in himself, but is only what? Temporary. I want you to be mindful of those words. Joy, root, temporary. Joy, root, temporary. Say that with me. Joy, root, temporary. One more time. Joy, root, temporary. He has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary. When affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. Luke's version of this in 8.13 says, Those on the rocky soil are those who, when they hear, they receive the word with what? Joy. Joy and yet, these have no firm what? Root. Now notice Luke adds something. He says, they believe for a while. Say, they believe for a while. They believe, they believe for a while and in time of temptation, fall away. Here, Luke tells us, uh, the same thing happens. They receive the word with joy, but they don't have firm root. And actually, he tells us that those who receive the word, yet the rocks get in the way. It says they believe for a while. That's interesting. And last, in Mark chapter 4, in a similar way, those on whom the seed was sown in rocky places, when they hear the word, immediately they receive it with what? Joy. And they have no firm what root in themselves, but are only... Don't fade on me now. I'm in the first minute of the sermon. Don't fade on me now. They're only what? Temporary. Yeah, they're only temporary. Then when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately they fall away. And last week we talked about how when trouble comes, all sorts of kinds of trouble, tribulation, persecution, affliction, sickness, difficulty in this life, just the fact that we live in a broken world, consequences of sin, spiritual attack, all sorts of trouble. When trouble comes... Regardless of the source, we have a moment and an opportunity to say, are we going to hold fast to God's word and to trust him and still follow Jesus? Or are we going to quit? When life gets hard, what will we do? The stones, the rocks, the trouble in life, they're either designed to stop you or to strengthen you. What's trouble going to do in your life? Is it going to stop you or is it going to strengthen you? I want it to strengthen me. I don't want to be temporary. I don't want to be a temporary Christian. Right? I want to bear fruit. I want to push through the devil's attacks. I want to push through the rocky places. I want to get rid of the thorns. And I want to end up in the end where I have a fruitful life, where I look like Jesus. Hmm. So last week we talked about how we don't always know the source, but the reaction to trouble is the same. Who do we turn to? The Lord. Amen? Amen. Difficulty in life is oftentimes when we grow the most. I wish it wasn't true. But it is. If you've lived more than a minute on earth, you know that sometimes, especially uh, as a Christian, we see that sometimes trouble is when we grow. The times of trouble and difficulty are when we grow the most. We grow during good times too. But sometimes it's the trouble that really strengthens us. I want to look at a story right after the parable here in chapter 5 of Mark. This is a story about a man uh, who is known as the man amongst the tombs. Verse 1, they, Jesus and his disciples, they came to the other side of the sea into the country of the Gerasenes. And when he, Jesus, got out of the boat, immediately a man ran from the tombs with an unclean spirit and met him. He had his dwelling among the tombs and no one was able to bind him anymore, even with a chain, because he had been he had often been bound with shackles and chains and the chains had been torn apart by him and the shackles broken in pieces and no one was strong enough to subdue him. This man afflicted and tormented by an evil spirit, demons, is living amongst the tombs and he is so held captive by the devil that even man's attempts to hold him captive so he doesn't do damage or frighten the villagers is futile. He's breaking chains. 
Verse 5, constantly, night and day, he was screaming among the tombs and in the mountains and gashing himself with stones. What a sad, what a sad story. Verse 6, seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him. That's a great verse. Seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him. And shouting with a loud voice, he said, What business do we have with each other, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God, do not torment me. For he had been saying, Jesus had been saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And he was asking him, What is your name? And he said to him, My name is Legion, for we are many. Legion is a word meaning many in a military sense. And he began imploring him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now there was a large herd of swine feeding nearby on the mountain. The demons implored him, saying, send us into the swine so that we may enter them. Jesus gave them permission. I mean, what is going on here? If you're reading this going, this is just a nice, normal Christian church story. You are not listening. This is not in the children's Bible. It's like Noah and the cute little animals, Daniel and the lion's den, and the man amongst the tombs. Good night. Wow. Jesus gave them permission, and coming out, the unclean spirits entered the swine. The herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea, about 2,000 of them, and they were drowned in the sea. Wow. Their herdsmen, the men that owned the, the pigs, the herdsmen ran away and reported it to the city and in their country. And the people from these villages, they came to see what it was that had happened. Now, I would imagine that this man was well known amongst the townspeople, right? They literally had uh, sent people out there to chain him up. He was out away from the city, away from where people lived, living in the tombs, apparently by the seashore, because Jesus sees him immediately when he gets there. This man not only has been tormented himself, uh, perhaps for a, a long time, but certainly has frightened the people in the village. And then Jesus shows up. And then Jesus shows up. And Jesus, being greater than any demon, any force of hell, any force of darkness, commands the demons to be out. And there's this weird moment where they negotiate where they're going to go. They want to go in pigs. Whether or not there's a lesson there about eating too much bacon, I'm not going to get into it. But the herdsmen realize this has happened because their uh, herd just went off a cliff into the sea. They go tell the villagers. Imagine them coming in saying, let me tell you what just happened. The man amongst the tombs. No, not the man amongst the tombs. Yes, the man amongst the tombs. He's different now. The demons have been cast out of him. Well, well how do you know? Well, they went into my pigs and the pigs went off a cliff. <laughs> Amazing. Verse 15. They came to Jesus and observed the man who had been demon possessed, sitting down, clothed and in his right mind. Wow. The very man who had had the legion. And the people of the city, they became what? Frightened. What an interesting response. Those who had seen it described to them how it had happened to the demon-possessed man and all about the swine. And they began to implore him, talking about Jesus, they began to implore him to stay longer and heal the rest of us. That would have been what you would have thought. A man delivered, well-known, uh, incredible miracle. But the people's response is odd. They're frightened. And then when they realize what had happened, they want Jesus to leave. And, and as he was getting to the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed was imploring them that he might accompany him. And he did not let them, but he said to him, Jesus said to the man, Go home to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in Decapolis what Great things Jesus had done for him, and everyone was what? What an awesome story. What an awesome testimony. How hard do you think it was for this uh, formerly possessed uh, by a demon man to give his testimony? Do you think he was nervous? You think when the synagogue said, hey, it's testimony Saturday here at Beth Israel Temple Shalom here in De the Decapolis, does anyone want to testify to the goodness of God? Do you think anyone could have stood in his way from being first on that mic? Of course not. He's telling everyone, right? He has just experienced deliverance and healing, freedom, rescue. He's been translated from the dominion of Satan into the kingdom of God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Because Jesus showed up. This man has been delivered and healed. He meets the Messiah. But yet in this story, 
you can already see the seeds of conflict in the future. When the village, villagers come out to see what happened, it says they were frightened. It says that after they hear the story, they ask Jesus to leave. They don't want, hap they don't want him to stay. This man has a testimony to share. This man has received the word with joy. But you know, his real life is going to begin once Jesus gets in that boat. Genuine, miraculous miracle and story. Joy unspeakable. But when this man goes back into the town, he's excited, he's on fire, but how are the people going to respond to his joy and his enthusiasm? Are they going to receive him with joy? Are they going to be skeptical of his story? Are they going to be convicted by his deliverance? Are they going to wonder what this means for them? And how the people respond has the potential to affect his faith. You ever been excited about something and someone doesn't share your excitement? That's like the worst and most annoying thing ever. You come home and tell this amazing story about something that happened or you're with your friends at the office and you tell them and they go, yeah, yeah, I already knew that. Yeah. <laughs> well, could you have pretended you didn't because I'm excited, right? Other people's reactions sometimes can quench your joy. When, when you think something's amazing and someone starts asking you questions that you didn't think about, it starts to quench your joy a little bit. This man is excited on fire, but his real life begins after verse 20, when he goes into town to see how the people are going to respond because trouble can make your joy go away and other people's reaction can make your joy go away. And so the question for him and for us is, what are we going to do when trouble comes? What are we going to do about our story of the goodness of God when tribulation comes? What are we going to do when the newness and the freshness wears off? What are we going to do when the excitement wears off? What are we going to do when life gets hard or life gets painful or life gets boring or normal? In 1792, in Northampton, England, a great sermon was preached at a pastor's conference by a young minister named William Carey. He was pushing up against the uh, spirit of uh, what he saw in the church growing where people did not think that they should uh, share the gospel with other people. And he preached this rousing sermon where the summary statement was, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. What a line, huh? Expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. I wish I had thought of that. That would have been a sermon. That, that's a bumper sticker. That's a shirt. That's a catchphrase. Expect great things from God. Say that. Expect great things from God. Attempt great things, Attempt great things for God. And as this Baptist minister got the whole room excited and fired up and ready and saying, let's go spread the gospel to the ends of the earth. Let's go. God is going to be with us. Let's do it. We trust him. He's with us. This is his desire. Come on, who's with me? And then they all, hey! An older pastor stood up and said, young man, sit down. Sit down. You are an enthusiast. When God pleases to convert the heathen, he'll do it without your help or mine. Wow. How's that for a response to like the best sermon of your life? Right? And I think in that moment, William Carey could have quit. Opposition, trouble, maybe even persecution about his zeal and his fire. That was a moment when he could have quit. But in 1792, he decided not to quit because in 1793, he went to India with the gospel. And he was there for seven years before anyone converted to Christianity. I mean, some of you could not go to India for seven hours without wondering if you're going to deconvert from Christianity. He went there because he believed God wanted him to do it, because he believed in the great commission of Jesus to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And for seven years, he had 365 days times seven to quit because nothing was happening. No one believed, and he experienced all sorts of trouble. So the joyful man pounding the pulpit in England goes to India for seven years and he could have quit, but he didn't because in 1800, he had his first baptism. And I'm sure that would have been 
reason enough why he went for that one soul. But you know what? Even then he didn't quit. And he stayed for another 21 years. And William Carey and his associates by 1821 had baptized 1,407 believers. Because he didn't quit when someone said, eh, I don't know about that. Or when things were difficult or where things were hard, he kept going because his zeal and his enthusiasm may have faded, but his commitment to his God did not. The fact is, excitement and enthusiasm are powerful motivators to do God's will. But they can be unreliable sources of motivation to do God's will. They're great. I love being fired up. But you know what? Being fired up doesn't always do the trick. Experience and emotion are wonderful, but they fade. Experiences and emotion are wonderful, but they're unreliable. Experiences and emotion are wonderful, but they're inconsistent. And experience and emotion, as wonderful as they are, they are not a guarantee of truth. And this parable, the parable of the sower and the rocky soil, is warning against our tendency to trust experience and emotion alone. They receive the word with joy. They believe for a while. But when difficulty came, when obstacles came, they quit. And so we need to be on guard, church. You want to have a fruitful life? Be on guard against emotion and experience being the only way you equate the presence of God. We can go chasing an emotional experience because we want to feel God. We can go chasing an experience or, or, or something that fires us up because we feel God is in that room. When the music plays just right, God's there. When we sing an old hymn and the organ comes out, we go, where'd God go? We don't want to be like that, right? Because worshiping God is more than singing, amen? And God being at work in your life is more just walking on sunshine, amen? And experiencing God is more than just what happens in your emotion. Because if the sermon is good but goes too long, and don't worry, I'm going to do my best for it not to go too long. But if the sermon is good but it goes too long, you tune out. I tune out. I start thinking about what time it is. I start, I start thinking about uh, what else I could be doing and not is God still speaking. If the songs aren't your style, we wonder what happened and why. If, if your ask uh, of God is so big but it takes some time, you wonder what's really going on. If the teaching topic doesn't seem relevant, do you check out? I am so tempted in all those areas, but I don't, I don't want to be like that. I don't want to be like that. Look at what Jesus said in, in John chapter 8. I love this verse. John chapter 8, verses 30 through 32. As he spoke these things, many came to what? Believe. Many came to believe in him. Is that a good thing while Jesus is speaking to believe in him? Yeah. Yes. Many came to believe in him. And so Jesus was saying to the Jews who had believed, not the ones that didn't, not the crowds that didn't, but to the Jews who had believed in him, he says, if you continue in my word, then you're truly disciples of mine. And you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. You see, Jesus commends that they have faith, that they believe, but he doesn't say that's where it ends. He's preaching, he's teaching, the people respond. He says, if you really want to be my disciple, it's not just about believing, it's about continuing in my word. It's not just about a moment, it's about a lifestyle, it's about a journey. Now, why did he say this? He says this because belief was not just the end goal, discipleship to him was. What's the next verse on the screen? Verse 33. We just read verse 32. There's another verse right after that. Okay, they believe... He says, if you want to truly be my disciples, continue in my word. Well, it's a good thing he said that. You know why? Because at the end of that, verse 33, they answered, and said, they answered him and said, we are Abraham's descendants, have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? 
These are the people that believed in him. He says, continue to follow me. Leave behind the old way. Let's go. We're going to walk this new kingdom way and you can be free. And they don't go, woohoo, let's go free. Where the spirit of the Lord is. What? No. They go, what do you mean free? We've never been enslaved to anyone. We're Abraham's descendants. I'm sorry, my Bible has an entire book of Exodus which describes the descendants of Abraham being slave for 400 years in Egypt. What do you mean, I don't need to be free. I mean, like I liked everything you were saying, like do the thing where you make like more food out of those few loaves and fish, I like that. Go heal someone again, I like that, but you're saying something deeper needs to happen? Well, I don't know how I feel about that. What do you mean free? Very next verse. Yet they had believed. Sounds like Jesus knows what he's talking about. Is that the understatement of the millennium, that Jesus knows what he's talking about? Just a few verses after this, verse 51 and 52, Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. What an invitation. We love that. The Jews said to him, now we know you have a demon. Verse 30, they believed. Verse 52, they say he has a demon. Because believing his word wasn't the end goal. Becoming his disciple was. And when the joy wears off, and when the enthusiasm wears off, and the food is gone, and the uh, excitement starts to fade, or when things are difficult rather than easy, or when there's like a loud noise in the room, and everybody goes, what is going on here? What, what do we do? We, we have to decide. Are we here for Jesus, or are we here for something for ourselves? Everyone wants a Jesus who makes their life better, but what if following Jesus makes your life harder? Well, then we have to ask ourselves, why are we coming to Jesus? We don't just come to Jesus for our lives to get better, although they do. We come to Jesus for our sins to be forgiven and our lives to be transformed. We don't just come to Jesus for life improvement, though our lives improve. We come to Jesus and receive eternal life. Sometimes following Jesus is full of excitement and miracles and moments and power. And sometimes you're just walking on a road in Galilee. But in the best days or in the blah days, Jesus is there. When life is beautiful, when life is bad, when life is blah, God is good and Jesus is Lord. Amen? Amen. And so that's why we need to understand in this parable the importance of letting our roots grow. Because if you remember what Jesus said, he said when trouble comes, when tribulation comes, when affliction comes, it's, and the rocks are in the soil, it's threatening the growth of the roots. And these people who believe for a while, but when trouble comes, they lose their joy. The experience wears off, the excitement wears off because they didn't have deep roots. Let's talk about roots. You know what roots are for? Roots in a plant are for absorption of water and inorganic nutrients. Turn to your neighbor and say, roots are for absorption of water and inorganic nutrients. That's right. That's right. Roots are for the absorption of water and inorganic nutrients. Roots are for anchoring the plant body to the ground and supporting it. Roots are for storage of food and nutrients. And roots are for the conduction, the movement of resources to the stem. Let's think about a plant for a moment and how important the roots are. Roots are what allow for water and the food that the plant needs to absorb it. Plants don't absorb nutrients with their leaves and their fruit or their stems or their branches. Do you know what absorbs the food they need to survive? The roots. Roots anchor a plant. Not the top, not the side, not the branches, not the fruit. Oh, if it has a lot of apples, let's make sure some apples are over here and some over here so that when the winds come, it'll stand. That's not what does it. What does it is the roots. The roots hold the tree in the ground. You ever see after a big windstorm in, in Rhode Island, like the tree that's just toppled over, 
and there's roots everywhere, everywhere. Well, something happened to those roots that made it so it couldn't anchor it like it was supposed to. Roots store the food and the nutrients. Do you know that the plants, uh, the trees right now that do not have leaves on them are still alive? Not just the evergreens. Like during the winter season, the trees don't all die. The leaves die. The trees don't die. You know why? Because of the roots. And through a season when they're not getting the same nutrients that they need, when the resources that make them thrive and go fruit, grow fruit are not available, the tree doesn't die because if the root system is good, it'll have what it needs when times are tough. That's what the roots are for. And then lastly, the roots are for conduction. They move things around. Say, the roots move things around. Will you do that with me? The roots move things around. The roots enable the tree or the plant to get what needs to be gotten to the place that it needs to be gotten and received. Because of the roots. Because the roots are down deep, but there's this network of roots that goes through the whole tree that makes sure that what is needed at the right place at the right time gets there. Not the leaves, not the fruit, not the stems, not the stuff that we see. Things that are hidden allow for this plant to survive. The roots. How important are the roots. And yet, you can't see any of this above the surface. You don't see any of the roots. You don't see any of this growth that's happening below the surface. And it would be easy for us to look at a plant that doesn't seem to be growing the way we think it should because the fruit hasn't matured at just the right time or these trees out there without leaves. It would be easy for us to think that nothing is happening. Oh, but a lot's happening. You just can't see it. It's just not obvious. It's just not flashy. We have an altar call. We hear a great sermon. The music just hits right. You read a book that changes your life. You go through a 12-step class. You meet with a small group, and, and things change. And the nights when everybody's crying, tears of joy, I will never forget in my entire life. Amen. Aren't those special moments? But you know what gets you to the moment of breakthrough? A bunch of nights of nothing. A bunch of nights of no tears. A bunch of nights where you're not sure if you want to go, but you go anyway. That's what gets you to the breakthrough. That, that's what gets you to the good place. That's what gets you away from the bad place, the faithfulness and the endurance and the root building that nobody can see, but a lot is happening. You cannot skip the step of root growth. Jesus says that this plant sprouts up and it's exciting. Look, there's a plant, but it doesn't last. It's temporary. And there's a lot of people like that. I don't want to be one of those people. When nothing is happening in our lives or when bad things seem to be happening and we stay faithful and follow Jesus, you know what you're doing? Growing your roots. When you're going through difficult times and staying faithful to Jesus Christ, you know what you're doing? Growing your roots. When it's a season of blah or it seems boring, but you stay faithful and you keep showing up and you follow Jesus, you know what you're doing? Growing your roots. Something is happening during these times that is critical for the next time, and you don't get to the good place unless you've endured through the tough place. Every time you push through the rocky places in your life, you're building roots. Let's close in Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, page 964. I don't want to be temporary. How about you? I don't want to be temporary. Whatever happened to so-and-so? Whatever happened to that guy over there? You know, whatever happened to that? No, no, I don't want to be like that. I, want to, I don't want to be temporary. Matthew 7, verse 24. Everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on a what? On the rock. And the rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, and slammed against that house, yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. 
Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and slammed against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. When you go and look at a house, uh, what they uh, encourage you to do uh, as you're selling your house is to dress it up real nice. It's called curb appeal, right? When you drive by the house, before you get to go into the house, you drive by it and you go, ooh, that's nice, right? The picture's on Zillow. They got the gray slate floor and the stainless steel appliances and the marble countertops, and you go, ooh, ooh. How many bedrooms? Ooh, how many closets? Ooh, look at that backyard. Ooh, new grass. Ooh, there's a shed. Ooh, there's parking. Ooh. The foundation of the house is the least exciting part of the house. But it's the most important part of the house. You're not built on the right foundation. It doesn't matter what kind of paint you use. It doesn't, kind of, it doesn't matter what kind of appliances you use. It doesn't matter how nice uh, your bed is and how many gadgets you have in the house. You are in trouble. Nobody looks at the foundation. Nobody says, well, how's the foundation? Well, who put the foundation in? Or has the foundation been uh, verified and tested? But yet that's the most important part. And so what Jesus says here is, these two men both build houses. Both appear on the outside to have a house that has been built. Both of these men have lives that on the outside you can look at and say, ooh. But only one of them has a house and a life that can withstand difficulty because it was built on a sure foundation. And what is a sure foundation? Hearing and doing what Jesus said. Hearing and doing what Jesus said is how you build your life upon the rock. He doesn't say building your house upon the rock is what will make it so no storms come. He doesn't say that building your house upon the rock will mean the winds don't blow and things aren't difficult and there might be a leaky spot through that window or whatever. These two houses, the difference is what they are built upon. And if your life is built upon hearing and doing what Jesus said, even when it seems boring at times, even when it seems like nothing is happening, you're just staying faithful day in and day out. You're building your foundation on a rock. When the storms come, you will be able to withstand them. You won't be temporary. So, emotion, experiences, excitement, getting stirred up, great things. But the thing Jesus is looking for from all of us and inviting us to is to follow him by hearing and doing what he said in the good, in the bad. Because in the end, that is how we build our lives on a rock so our houses can withstand whatever may come. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to uh, not be temporary. God, I don't want to just praise you and worship you when things are good. I want to praise you and worship you when things are difficult. And in the in-between. <coughs> Father, I want to obey and follow Jesus when things are good and it makes sense and when things are difficult and I don't understand why that would be the way. Please, help me to follow him and hear him and obey him and just that be my default setting. I pray God this morning for those of us that feel like we're in a storm. Who feel like the wind's blowing and the rain is falling and it's dark outside and it's loud and it's banging. Lord, I pray that you would help us to have peace knowing that our lives are built upon a rock. I pray this week as we go out with joy and enthusiasm and excitement and resolve to live for Jesus, if we have obstacles, help us to not quit. With people, if they, they go, well, I don't know about that, that we would stay as joyful and as excited as we are on a Sunday morning. Father, I guess what I'm asking is that you would grow our roots, strengthen our roots, 
so we can stand and have what we need when times are lean. Lord, give us resolve in our heart and a desire to live for you, period, end of sentence. That you may receive the glory through Jesus, we pray.